do you do, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls? I am Julius Sumner Miller, and physics is my business. And our special business today is Newton's second law, the second law. Now, in an earlier program, we discussed the first law, and I showed you some dramatic demonstrations on the first part, a body at rest, and on the second part, a body moving uniformly wants to do that. Now we come to Newton's second law. This is a staggering thing in its implications and very, very difficult, really. But what students of physics learn somewhere in their course is that Newton's second law says F equals MA. And indeed, that's what it says. But that's powerful and not so easy. Let us see what Newton said for his second law. In the Latin, mutationum motus proportionalum esse we motrici. But the Latin is a little old-fashioned, so if we look at the English, here it is. Change of motion is proportional to force applied and takes place in the direction of the straight line in which the force acts. So, let me demonstrate Newton's second law. Here I have two carts, a heavy one, a massive one, and a less massive one, and they are connected with a pseudo spring, an array of rubber bands, which are called elastic bands, but which incidentally are inelastic. Now they are on wheels so that they move rather freely, but we learned earlier that this one has less inertia than this one. Now, when I pull them apart and stretch the spring between them, the same force acts on both. And let us see if we cannot at once predict what will happen. If we apply Newton's second law to the forces acting on these cars, clearly the big car will have a little acceleration and the little car will have a big acceleration. That's an obvious thing to, to speculate on. Watch it. I'm going to pull them apart. There is one and the same force acting on both cars, and you will observe that the smaller one gets going the faster sooner. Of course. And so, here is an expression mathematically that describes this. And what do we learn from that remark? We learn that the accelerations are inversely proportional to the masses. The bigger the mass, the less the acceleration. Now, this experiment with the two cars, very important for our concern later, because we will talk in subsequent programs about the energy possessed by each car and about the momentum possessed by each car, and we shall learn then that Newton's second law has enormous implications for later work in physics. Now, more about <clears throat> the second law. Here is a scale on which I hang a weight. And I don't care what the scale reads, it reads something. We say it reads the weight of the body. But I really don't know what that means. Nor did Newton, because as we believe, gravitational forces, the Earth pulls on this, stretches the scale. But remember, even Newton said, I offer no hypothesis concerning gravitation. Nor do we understand it today. But anyway, this scale reads the weight of this. So I'm going to write Newton's second law saying that very fact. Here it is. F equals mg, where mg is the weight of the body. Now I'm going to accelerate this system upward. And I want you to see what the scale does. Watch it now. The scale read more. And so I have to add here ma. In other words, the scale reads not only the rest mass of the body, but an additional force which was required to accelerate it upward. Let me now start again in the zero position, the system at rest, the scale reading, the so-called weight of the body, and let me accelerate downward. Watch it. The scale reads less, and so I write minus ma, mg minus ma. And this tells us a wonderful thing, because if I were to go to the edge of my roof and hold this like this, 
and then let go of it here, and the whole thing fell down toward the earth? A good question to ask is, what would the scale read during the falling? And the answer is obvious. Since the acceleration downward would be that of a freely falling body, the scale would read zero. So if I should jump off from my tabletop, while I am in flight toward the earth, I weigh, I am weightless. I am weightless. Now, <clears throat> this second law bears on the first one, which I showed in an earlier program. You remember that I had an enormous weight here, which, uh, on which I pulled gently with a string, and the string held it. But when I gave the system a sudden acceleration upward, the string cannot endure it. And I said then that the body wishes to remain at rest. I now add an additional fact, that the string must exert a force not only equal to the weight of the body, but an additional one to accelerate it, which it may not be able to do. No, it couldn't do it. Now, what is the meaning of this? for other things. Supposing I had an enormous sphere, such as I have here, a steel sphere, two inches in diameter, and then a teeny weensy one. And I want to show you that. I want to show you that. In fact, here I have several of different sizes. There's one. There's one. Very good. Now, I have one in here that is so tiny, in fact, that I can't see it without my glasses. That shows you how tiny it is. And I wonder, if I get the other debris out of the way, can the camera get that little one? Right. Right. Well, it's there. I assert it is there, even though you cannot see it. Oh, yeah, it's awful tiny. And what am I going to say about it? Supposing I hold these two, I won't hold the tiny one because you can't see it. Supposing I hold these two at the same horizontal level, above the level of the earth equally, and I let them go. They fall with the same acceleration. Proof. Newton's second law. Proof.